All right, welcome to our New York Giants Preservation Society meeting for uh, tonight, Thursday, uh, August 25th. It's, it's great having David Krell back. David spoke uh, a few years back on his new book at that time, 1962, which was a fabulous book. And he detailed a lot about the Giants uh, in, in that uh, Zoom session. Just a couple, a couple of updates. Um, I was able to uh, get the Dusty Rhodes family, uh, his son and his daughter. Uh, they'll be speaking to our group in December. Uh, with a great story on, on, on Dusty Rhodes. Um, I will be sending out emails regarding uh, possible getting, uh, getting together in New York to see a Met game. Uh, since the schedule's out, I believe it's at the end of July next year. And in case some of you did not notice, the Giants actually open at Yankee Stadium on, uh, I believe, March 30th or March 31st in 2023. So anyway, uh, without further ado, tonight we have a special night. David, uh, David Krell is going to be um, speaking about Willie Mays' return to uh, New York and the Mets. And some of us, including myself, were fortunate enough to be at that game uh, a while back. But anyway, let's give a nice round of applause to David Krell. David, thank you so much. But not only speaking tonight, but for changing your schedule to accommodate us. Floor is yours. No problem. Thank you so much for having me. I have to acknowledge Greg Prince. Greg is quoted in the Saber Journal article, the Baseball Research Journal article. It's like coming home to paradise, which is in the most recent issue. Uh, and that's why I'm here. I, I want to talk about three things. I want to talk about the early 70s. I want to talk about Mrs. Payson and the 70s Mets, and then, of course, talk about uh, Willie and the trade and the home run on Mother's Day. I, I took a class at the University of Maryland uh, years ago when dinosaurs roamed the earth called American Studies 298A. And around campus, it was called the history of rock and roll. But the actual name of the course was Contemporary American Music in America 1945 to the present. And what Dr. Hugo Kiesing did in this class, which meant on Monday nights, was illustrate the importance of context and how nothing really happens in a vacuum, especially in popular culture. So we would study the development and the evolution and the changes yeah. in cultural iconography and sure sort of the box office draw in 1965 versus 1975 and things like that. So I put that uh, I put that tool by my side. I took it out of the toolbox and started to analyze the '70s because I wanted to give it some context. I didn't have room in the in the piece to talk as much as I would have liked to. So I want to take a couple of minutes and and illustrate some points that I think are relevant. Uh, the early 1970s was very much a nostalgic time. And if you look at, at songs that were popular, if you look at Ricky Nelson or Rick Nelson after a certain time, his song Garden Party was about a concert and he was being laughed at at Madison Square Garden because he was doing all these old songs that 19, late 1960s, early 1970s audiences didn't want. And Garden Party became a hit. And you have things like Piano Man, which is a very nostalgic autobiographical song by Billy Joel about his six months. It was only six months uh, in in L.A. as a lounge piano uh, player. Um, you, you had A Taxi Driver by Harry Chapin, which is a really sad, mournful autobiographical story. I see a lot of nodding heads. I mean, the, there was something in the early 70s, things were opening up. There were, songs had more emotion to them. The lyrics were more explanatory. They were more re revelatory. Uh, Mary Tyler Moore comes back to television in 1970. That's a nostalgic play. You know, she left the Dick Van Dyke show. Her Broadway career didn't get off the ground. Her film career didn't get off the ground. She does a special with Dick Van Dyke called Dick Van Dyke and the Other Woman. And then CBS says, hey, how would you like, we'd like to be in the Mary Tyler Moore business again because the Dick Van Dyke show was on CBS. 
and they came up with the Mary Tyler Moore show, or technically it's Mary Tyler Moore. Uh, if you see the, the rolling name in the credits, it just says Mary Tyler Moore, not the Mary Tyler Moore show. Uh, this all comes into play, I think, with Willie. Uh, Gil Hodges dies at the beginning of the 72 season or right before. And the 1970s Mets, I want to talk about them for, for a second. They were powerful. Some of you guys are old enough to remember how devastatingly uh, fearsome the pitching was. And they just were not able to beat the Reds or the Pirates, uh, you know, to, or the Dodgers to get to that next level to repeat in 69. I know they got there in 73, but that was just barely. And if uh, if anyone, just by a show of hands, who was at the Hofstra 50th anniversary conference 10 years ago? So Greg was there. So you you remember the play, Mike was there. You remember the, the player panel. I don't know which one it was. I think it was Crane Pool who said if Gil Hodges had survived the heart attack they'd have a few more world series rings on their fingers and that might be true who, who who's to say the the 1970s is kind of a riches to rag story for the mets start off great and then after siebert gets traded in 77 they go downhill i think there's something really telling about being a mets fan we inherited uh the giants and the dodgers perhaps from our parents and, and grandparents, the love of those two teams. And it transferred that uh, we have the blue and the orange. Joan Payson is a nexus to the Giants, obviously, to the golden era, because she did not want the team to move. You all know that. Uh, she did not want the team to move. She was a, a philanthropist. She was an art collector. She donated a lot of money to make uh, Long Island Jewish Hospital happen. And but her love was baseball, and she was not in some owner's skybox, you know, getting served hors d'oeuvres and steak. She was down right in back of the dugout, kibitzing with whomever, Willie Gil Hodges, Yogi Berra, whomever. So I, I think that's important, and it all comes into play with the trade. Now I did not know that I, I did not know much about Horace Stoneham. I'll say that. Uh, Stephen's book came out, Stephen Trader, and I, it's still on my on my list. I just have other books to get to before his, and it's a long overdue biography. I understand it's excellent. I, I did not know that Mr. Stoneham really didn't want to trade Willie, but he felt he had to. He felt he owed it to him. That's the sense that I got. And, and I think Herman Franks had disclosed in an article that they were talking about Willie ending his career in New York. And somebody correct me if I'm wrong or the whole room. Did, was was there ever any serious talk about Joan Payson uh, giving Willie a statue at a certain point? Did, 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 did she want a statue of Willie? Had anyone heard that story? No. Okay, it, might, it might be an apocryphal story. So Willie gets traded. Depending on what you read, it could be $50,000 or $100,000. It may be somewhere in between. And Charlie Williams. And Willie comes to New York. So against this nostalgic backdrop, against the backdrop of Mrs. Payson getting her favorite player back to New York where he's beloved. You know, Willie would play stickball in the streets with the kids. So against all of this, he's hitting somewhere in the 180s in 19 games that he plays in 72. He pinch hits in his last game for the Giants. He comes to New York. It's Mother's Day weekend. And he hits a game-winning home run, turns out to be the game-winning home run, uh, on Mother's Day. And the whole crowd, it's on YouTube, the whole crowd just mm -hmm. erupts in joy. I personally, and I, this could just be me being romantic about baseball, I personally don't know if it would have had the same emotional impact if he had been traded in 66 or 65 or 68 or even 69, I think by the, by 1972, the country had been through emotional storms, emotional tidal waves in the past 10 years. John Kennedy assassinated, Robert Kennedy assassinated, Martin Luther King Jr. assassinated, Vietnam War escalating, protests, civil rights, riots. I, especially in New York, which in the 70s was volatile at best. Uh, um, the 66 book that I wrote that's coming out in March, 
it starts with John Lindsay and a transit strike. I mean, every time you turn over the paper year after year, there's a garbage strike, there's a transit strike, there's always something going on in New York, and it's really, really difficult. So I was only five at the time, but my feeling, and for those who were in the New York area at that time, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, it just seemed like New York needed a win, that they needed to feel good. Uh, it, beyond baseball, beyond the Mets winning a pennant or something like that, there was just something magical when when a, a beloved figure comes back to where he started. I think there there was something really magical in 1972 that might not have been there in '66. There might have been cheers, but I don't think it would have it would have been as emotionally needed as it was in '72. I mean, that's just my sense by doing the research culturally and just looking at the history and so forth. Uh, I, you know, if Babe Ruth went back to Baltimore, although there was no ball, there were no Baltimore Orioles then. So he goes to, he goes to uh, Boston. Um, you know, I, I don't think he had the same reception there, even though he played for the Braves. I think that was a little different, uh, but, but Willie coming back just has a certain resonance, even though he lost a step, he was not the, the outfielder he was. He wasn't the hitter he was. He could still bang the ball over the fence from time to time. But, you know, he was 40 years old. His legs weren't, uh, his legs were, weren't the 25-year-old legs that we remember when we watch the film clips. I see a lot of nodding heads. It was a little sad. I've heard people uh, at Sabre conferences talk about 73 and how it was sad to see Willie not being able to run like he used to, to first base. Uh, same thing with Mickey Mantle. If you look at Mickey Mantle hitting his 500th home run, it's on YouTube. Mickey can barely make it around the bases. He looks like an old man. He's limping. He's 36 years old or something around there, mid thirties. He just, his body was so torn up by that point. And there's something a little sad, but at least Willie got to, end where he started that he didn't go to Detroit and he didn't go to Baltimore he didn't go to Oakland he you know he went where he was beloved still there were people who remember him and when you see the joy at least what came across to me when I watched the YouTube clip there was just sheer joy at seeing him hit the home run on Mother's Day beyond that of any other home run if Crane Pool had hit it yeah, we won the game and people would have cheered. But the fact that Willie does it, that that it's one last shot at grace. It's one, you know, one last shot at glory that he does it on a holiday weekend where I don't think anybody really expected much of him. Not, not for a guy hitting below 200 and only playing in a smattering of games. And I know he didn't. He was kind of a part-time player by that point, as yeah, as the Mets went on in '72 and then '73. So uh, I, I just want to say a couple a couple of other things to uh, to wrap up. Um, I'm I'm beginning to get a new appreciation personally for this group and for the Giants' legacy, uh, not only with uh, the biography of Stoneham that I'm about to read, uh, but also in researching the '66 book. I did not know there was a three-way pennant race between the Dodgers, the Giants, and the Pirates that year, and it literally came down to the wire. Uh, I think that the Giants are, um, from, what, from what I'm gathering, uh, underrated in the 60s, that they were extraordinarily competitive, but the Dodgers kept going to the series and kept getting the glory, and you know Bob Gibson outshone all pitchers with with his strikeouts and so forth. So I, I think there's a, there's a lot of room for scholarship of the 1960s giants moving forward. If anyone's interested in doing saber articles or books or the like, uh, there, there's certainly a lot of fodder there. David, is that the end of your presentation? No, I have a, a couple of other things to say to say and just as a postscript about context, if I if I can have a few minutes, if that's OK. David, you have all the time you need to right. discuss the game. 
anything you want, you stop. So I didn't know if you wanted us to. I, I want. I want to parallel the, the the context because what what I hope you come away with is when you see things like it could be Reggie hitting three home runs. Why was that so important in 1977? Well, if you read the Bronx is burning, you see why because New York was just this absolute chaotic place in 77. And when he hits the three home runs, it's a chance for New Yorkers to escape and just get rid of the headlines for a while. Uh, I was watching, uh, you know, so, some of these uh, shows on um, the rerun channels, you know, the shows like the A-Team, you know, the A-Team and Blue Thunder and Airwolf, these were shows of the Reagan era. The shows of the Carter era were Barnaby Jones and Quincy and, you know, more benign shows. So a, a lot of culture, a lot, especially a lot of sports and the sports heroes are, are reflections of the time, the reflections of, of where we are in that space. And I think what, what Willie represented to us at that time was a time of innocence. Now I say that, I say that because I, I also I also know that it wasn't that innocent, you know. Nineteen the nineteen fifty to fifty three era, we had the Korean War. So when people say the fifties were a time of innocence, well, they weren't a time of innocence. You know, the early sixties weren't always a time of innocence. We had the Cuban Missile Crisis in sixty two, but for one moment, when a hero, when it when a when someone who we ascribe to hero status, and I think we're safe in saying that Willie was a hero in baseball to New Yorkers at that time. Either you were old enough to remember him with the Giants before they left, or you were a kid and your father told you, or your uncle told you, or your neighbor told you, or your grandfather told or your teacher told or your little league coach told you. Somebody told you about Willie Mays in 1972 if you weren't old enough or didn't weren't alive in 57 when they left which devastated Giants fans and, of course, the Dodgers devastating Dodgers fans as well. So I, I just look at it a little different. I don't just look at it as a game where he comes in and hits a home run and it's it's kind of an ironic thing. It's maybe a, a poetic thing that he does that. I think you can make that argument, and I have. But I think there's also something else going on in, in the culture. And uh, with that, I'll, I see a couple of hands, so I'm happy to take any questions. Yeah, Dave, first of all, oh, great article. Thank you so Thank much. You. Uh, one thing I'm going to ask, uh, well, a comment, then I'm going to ask a question. Okay. Uh, who, who did Payson go to Stoneham or Stoneham went to Payson? Gosh, I, you know what? I, 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 I don't believe what I read because it, the, the truth is somewhere out there. I think Stoneham went to Payson. I think Stoneham needed the money. That's the st most popular story that I've read. Uh, but who knows if Payson had a conversation with him a year before saying, when you're ready, I, I want Willie back in New York. Right. You know, who, who knows if her representatives had reached out to him before. And Herman Franks was quoted as saying, no, we planned all this. You know, we, we wanted this to happen whether they wanted to happen two weeks before or two years before. And my sense is that talking to people, and you guys will, will know better than I would, uh, that Willie was never really comfortable in San Francisco. He, he was revered in New York. He was admired in San Francisco. But it, my take is that it, he didn't, um, there was not a mutual embrace as there was in New York. Uh, I could be wrong about that. Just one thing. I just, I'm reading Mike Murphy's book and he said, and he was really good friends with Willie or he still is obviously. He didn't want to get traded to the Mets. He didn't want to leave San Francisco according to what Mike Murphy says right. in the book. So I don't know. I mean, David, you also, you made the comment that in New York in 72 it was cultural, that he it was yeah. great. And if it was 66, it may not have been. Uh, you know, I don't live in San Francisco, but some of the guys in here do. And I, I think they were more uh, OK with him leaving in 72 because he was basically near the end. And if they would have traded him in 66, that would have been outrage in San Francisco, despite, yeah. you know, being McCovey's team, Cepeda, whatever the case may be. Right. Uh, one other comment I have, I was at that game. Yeah, I was 11 years old and I remember it really like it was yesterday. The only thing I didn't know was that it was Mother's Day because yeah. 
I'm shocked that my mother let us go to the game. Anyway, it was, it looked like the game was going to be cold the whole day. It was yeah. on and off. And my, my father said, we're going because he, that was his guy. And we went and Sam McDowell, I think threw 12 straight balls. Rusty Staub hit a grand slam. First inning, the Giants are down four, nothing. They come back. The Giants had a spare outfielder who's the same name as a famous Yankee, Bernie Williams. Bernie Williams. He had, he had a big hit. And then Mays, of course, hit the home run. But that was, in my opinion, being a Giant fan, that was the only time that it was okay for the Giants to lose. Who did he they, hit it off and, of? I'm sorry? Who did he hit it off of? Was it Don Carruthers? Don Carruthers, yeah. Don but, Carruthers, uh, yeah. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> you know, your, your cultural aspects of this are fabulous, and I thank you for uh, sharing them with us. Thank All right, we'll go, to, we'll go to Mars. Mars, you're up. Thank you, David, for joining us. I, I, I was one of the few in our club that watched Willie Mays play, because I'm 75 years old now, that watched him play in the polo grounds when he was a young player. And yeah. what an exciting player he was. My pop was really into the Giants way back from the uh, 1930s when he became of age and actually worked one of three jobs as a vendor in the polo grounds when the Giants were home and when the uh, uh, and worked at Yankee Stadium for Harry M. Stevens as an 18-year-old when the Yankees were home. But a couple of things I wanted to clarify that you mentioned. Uh, Joan Payson uh, was a minority stockholder right. and buy the Giants from Stoneham, but he wouldn't sell to her. Now, there are pros and cons on Horace Stoneham. One of the pros is that, you know, he was instrumental in bringing up a lot of black and Latin players, Alex Pompez. And that was, that was one of his uh, pros. Right. But he, he took uh, the biggest salary along with uh, sister, uh, when when the Giants were losing money and put no money uh, fixing up the polo grounds at all, never looked into other things like the New York football Giants on contacting the governor of New Jersey, perhaps moving there, uh, tried to get the Bronx side of the Whitestone Bridge for a new ballpark, Try to get the Hudson Docks, Mo Robert Moses turned them down on these things. And uh, last of all, uh, Willie Mays wasn't embraced uh, in San Francisco till around 1962. Yeah. And by that time, uh, you know, because of his great seasons, uh, you know, they finally started to come around to him. But they embraced McCovey and Marischal and the Olympics more than they were original San Francisco. Thank you. Let me, let me just address the Stoneham thing. My, my sense, and this is pure speculation, but if the price tag was $100,000 and a player, I, I believe that Stoneham, had he been approached by another team and the team said, we'll give you 125 and a player, I think he might have turned it down. I think he, he did this for Willie. Um, I, I don't think that, as much as I, I've heard the stories about being cash strapped and and foolish purchases and bleeding money and, and all of that. But the, the sense I got, and again, it's pure speculation, is that even if he had been offered a little bit more money, he still might have done the trade with Mrs. Payson. I agree. Bill Clank, you're up. Put me in um, line. Okay. You got it, Frank. All right. Uh, okay, Bill. Yeah, two questions, both dealing, David, with the 73 Mays. In September, uh, he hit his last home run. Yeah. Um, and uh, uh, Jim Beecham, who was sitting on the bench, uh, Mays came back and one of the uh, players said, uh, shouted, uh, somebody had to get that man's bat. It might be his last one. Well, Beecham actually did go get it. And in an interview I had with him, he showed, you know, he showed me, I have pictures of the bat my question is you know jim's passed away i don't know if this went to his family or does anyone have any sense that the final maze bat the final home run bat from september of 73 ever made it to the hall of fame you'd have to call the hall of fame library and okay. ask ask for the reference librarian and she'll be able to answer yes or no okay and, and if it's no she might know where it is yeah, I, I just have a suspicion that the Beecham family 
uh, possible. And it kept it. Uh, it hasn't shown up on Leland's, that's for sure. Yeah. Um, but um, the other question actually had to do with May's final game, not final at bat, final game, game seven. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, you know, I, as, at the time, it kind of passed me by. I think it passed Yogi by. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, here we have uh, Daryl Knowles coming in uh, in relief of Eckersley to get the final out. He's right. a left hander. He's going up against Wayne Garrett. Now, Wayne Garrett had hit 167 in the series uh, after hitting 087 in the LCS. Right. Mays hit 286 in the series and 333, I admit, in limited appearances. But he's a right hander. I, I don't care. Wait, I think, he, I think he it gets a base hit. He's going to make it the first. What, I, was, what was Yogi thinking? I, I think it also depends on uh, what what inning was this? Ninth inning. Oh, this two was hours. the ninth inning. Ninth um, inning I don't I don't know, uh, but I, I if they thought it was going to extra innings, and they didn't have a good third baseman to I don't know who the third baseman was in the second string. They might have been there might have been a concern about that. I I have no idea. Uh, they were down by a couple of runs. I, yeah. I think. It would have been something. Maybe Yogi had a, had a brain drain at that point because <laughs> the opportunity to let the greatest yeah. in what will be. I mean, they knew this was it. Yeah. There are no more games. Well, sure, Maybe because he's, he had said goodbye uh, like three weeks before, right? Say goodbye right. to America. So right. we it's, there was no 1974 no, on the horizon. Hey, this is done. This is game seven. Two out. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I wish I had had the opportunity to ask Wayne Garrett about that, what he mm -hmm. thought about that. And if, you know, he'd have been glad probably to have that bat to Willie yeah. Mays for that final line. I just don't know what Yogi was thinking. Righty against lefty, uh, experience versus not too much. Again, yeah. I, you know, when I look at the roster, you know, I, I think Kenny Boswell was still available. Um, no, he well, I mean, but to your point, I, you can say the same thing in reverse about Mother's Day. Should Willie really have even been in the lineup on on that Sunday? He had just flown from San Francisco. The trade happened. It, it all happened very quickly. So he has to deal with jet lag. He has to deal with the emotional turnover. And then he's playing his old team that he was just with a couple of days before should he have even been playing in the game? That's all the reason why he should be. It's it's a great stage. He steps up to the big stage. It's a, it's a great stage, but but I, I there's there's reality and there's romance. I know, I know. Romance dictates yes, put him there. Reality, maybe you would have given him another day of rest to let him acclimate, get him settled wherever he's settled, get him you know to meet everybody. I mean, he probably, they all, it's a small fraternity. They all know everybody, but you know, how, how does, how, you know, how he has to also educate his new team on the Giants pitchers yeah. and I, uh, and impart all this wisdom he's had for 20 years to the, to the new team. There's no chance to do that in just a day. Thank you for that. Perhaps Mays wanted to say to Yogi, I want to play. I, no, no athlete doesn't. It's so, it's so hard to say goodbye. That's why Joe Montana went to Kansas City and Joe Namath went to Los Angeles. And, you know, players just hang on wherever they can because they just want that last. They, they don't want to leave until they absolutely have to. They want that last uh, last grasp for the golden ring. You know, Bill, I, I think you mentioned accuracy. I think you meant Robert Singers. Uh, yeah. Pardon me? I think I think you said Eckersley. I think you meant Raleigh Fingers, and and Greg Prince. I Greg for some reason was Beecham. Did Beecham yeah. give up twenty four for me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Beecham, Beecham just, just joined the team that year. Yeah, and Beecham graciously gave it up. Beecham, you said with the bat, Bill. Uh, Beecham, not the final bat, according yeah. to his words to me. Beecham wore yeah. twenty four and gave it up for Mays when Mays joined the Mets. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Greg. All right, we're going to go to George, then Frank, then Bill Karen. George, you're up. I have a memory of him sliding into home plate in the A-Series back in 73. Uh, 
I remember him arguing with the uh, with the umpire. I also remember it was one of the longest games I've ever seen. We had tickets to a show that night on Long Island, and we I think we got there late because it was such a long World Series game. Do you have any recollection of that? No, I don't. When he ran oh. into home plate at the World Series, it was a play at the plate. The the first World play Series play, I remember yeah. watching I the seventy six series. That he was, wasn't called out. I think he was arguing with the young He was player. arguing that somebody was that I think yeah, yeah. Ron Harrelson or, or yeah. somebody was was out at home. Greg probably knows. He's Mr. Matt. Buddy. Bud Harrelson? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, thanks. Quite uh, iconic. Frank, go ahead. Frank Lewis. Was there any consideration of sending Willie to the Yankees? I didn't see anything substantive about that. But it wouldn't surprise me if Stoneham reached out to other teams if he couldn't get a decent figure. It wouldn't be it wouldn't surprise me if there was a list that he and his front office had put together just to test the waters. Because if Joan Payson said, I love Willie, but I'm only giving you twenty five thousand. I don't think that they would have made that deal. I don't think Mrs. Payson would have offered twenty five thousand. But just as a contingency, if he couldn't get. A, a player, maybe she wouldn't want to give up a player. Um, I wouldn't shock, wouldn't shock me if the Yankees were on that list. That would have been something to see Willie in a Yankees uniform. Well, Sonnen was sentimental, and you know yeah. I, that uh, in this case, money didn't matter. He knew, he, actually, he did Willie Mays a big favor. Right. Well, that's that's the thing when when you when you look at it in context, you know people. Until the the Hirsch book came out, um, I had always thought that uh, Hirsch was the biographer, right? Who wrote the the maze book, right? Until that came out, I always thought that you know Stoneham said, you know, we're done. He's old. We don't have no no use for him anymore. We'll get what we can. Uh, but after doing a little digging, yeah, he he protected Willie. He gave he gave him an out. He gave him a graceful out, almost almost like. Uh, when you when you force out a CEO and you make him chairman emeritus, where they well, weigh in, but they don't have any real uh, voting power on the board, they don't have any day to day power, but they can weigh in from time to time on important issues. I think that's what they were trying to do with Willie. Yeah. Thank, thank you, George. Uh, all right, so we're gonna go. Here's the pecking order: William, Greg, Prince, Renee, and then Bill. Mr. Uh, William, uh, Bill Mayer. Uh, let's go to William uh, Karen. Bill, go ahead. Dave, thank you for the presentation. It's very oh, thank enjoyable. You. What I wanted to say is that I read the book on Willie Mays by Hirsch. Mm -hmm. And Willie Mays explains in that book that uh, Where is it? when the Giants went to San Francisco, what happened was that that year, Cepeda was the rookie of the year. And right. In 59, McCovey was the rookie of the year. Right. So the fans embrace Cepeda and McCovey, not that they didn't want to embrace Mays. But here is their first and second year, and these two guys have tremendous years and win the rookie of the year award. Right. But McCovey had, was also homegrown. He had come through the system, and Mays came from New York. And yes, right. it's very exciting. You lose the Seals, but you get the Giants. And it's very, very exciting. And Willie Mays is a dynamite player, but he wasn't one of theirs. It, it's the, it's not exactly a parallel, but Mantle and Maris. People wanted Mantle to break Babe Ruth's record because he was a Yankee. Right. Roger had come from Kansas City. So right. even though he's helping them win games, there's still that sentimental attachment that, well, he came from somewhere else. Mickey's arcs. Exactly. And I think the same thing happened with McCovey. That's why when you see the, the, the cheering that goes on on that YouTube clip where Mays hits the home run, I think there's something more going on there than just winning a ball game, hitting a home run, scoring runs, beating the Giants. There's, there's a much more emotional, uh, there's more emotional depth than just the score. Right. And he's a New York hero. He's a New York icon. Absolutely. What I also wanted to ask you is that uh, I also read in a book that Mrs. Payson wanted to retire Willie Mays' number. 
On I'd heard that. Yes. And that she was waiting for him to be elected in 79, uh, oh, the Hall of Fame. That, that's what I read, not the statue, the, the number. But, yes. yeah. yeah, but that what happened was she died in 75. Right. And no one on the Mets ever, you know, decided to fulfill her dream. Yeah. Of having Mays's number. And since then, I think uh, I think maybe Ricky Henderson and Robin Robinson Cano have wore right. have won number twenty four for the Mets, but for some reason I've written to the Mets and I've never got an answer as to why they wouldn't uh, retire his number because it might the, it might the Brewers the Brewers did it for Henry Aaron when they sent yeah, the I, I, him to Milwaukee. Yeah, it might be an informal thing, not something that's written down, but it just might be one of those team tradition things that's not talked about yeah all right thank you thanks bill uh we got greg prince renee bob mayer and then richard summer greg mr met go ahead hey, thanks greg. gary hi david good to see you again tonight great Likewise. to hear from you uh just wanted to uh speak to a couple of your points about the cultural relevance of nostalgia two songs that kind of bracketed that season, one very famous, uh, one by an artist who is known to all of us here. Uh, the famous one, of course, is American Pie. Right. Uh, still very much on the radio in the right. spring of 72, probably the first song I ever identified with a particular moment in time. Uh, the other one, American City Suite by Cashman and West, Cashman being Terry Cashman, who joined right. us several months ago, which sort of goes about the... Uh, the sweet romantic notion of American cities and then the downfall. So uh, kind of speaking there, to what uh, you're speaking about. Yeah. Um, from a baseball perspective, you talked about why people held that candle, held that torch up for Willie Mays in New York, whether it was from personal experience going back to the 50s or as you said, uncles, fathers, mothers. Yeah. I'm gonna name three people, Bob Murphy, Ralph Kiner and Lindsey Nelson yeah. kept the whole history alive yeah. of what the New York Giants meant, what the Brooklyn Dodgers meant. Yeah. As a nine-year-old, I was primed for what it meant to have Willie Mays come back and primed for every old-timers day. Ironically, yeah. the Mets are reviving old-timers day this coming weekend. I couldn't be happier about that. Yeah. But it, it wasn't just a situation where, oh, we got a guy who was really good from another team. Right. It made all the sense in the world. And of course, it just elevated the next two years for a kid who was my age and i think you know it, it certainly had something to do even though he was yeah at the end of the trail i think it had a lot to do with putting together a team that could go on and win a pennant and unfortunately didn't quite win a world series so i, I appreciate you uh, putting this all into perspective oh, and uh, sharing with you. us and I, I want to add another song i learned this when i was researching my brooklyn dodgers book uh, I used to be a Brooklyn Dodger by Dion. And uh, I had never heard of that song before. It just did not get a lot of notice. And it's a really sweet, sentimental, nostalgic play on baseball. Thank you. And Greg. if you remember, by the way, when, uh, yeah. when the Mets were finally sold after Mrs. Payson died and after yeah. M. Donald Grant ran them into the ground and her daughter and granddaughters ran them into the ground even further. Uh, the way the Mets marketed themselves by 1980, albeit leaning a little toward the Brooklyn side of things, the very first, we, a lot of us remember the, uh, the phrase, the magic is back, which was the advertising slogan of the Mets yep. in 1980. The idea wasn't so much that, hey, the Mets are gonna be great now that they've been sold. The idea is we're bringing back that feeling that you right. guys from the 50s remember. And on right. the ads you would see, You'd see Jackie Robinson in those ads. You'd see Ralph Branca looking depressed in those ads. I don't know why you didn't see Bobby Thompson looking exultant, except I suppose Fred Wilpon's <laughs> the one who signed off on those right. ads. So that was a, a very strange, even fi final, final point. Um, you get to the early 1980s, late 1970s even. Who is the guy that the Mets are promoting more than anybody else? Good player, not a great player, but Mazzilli. treating them as if he's their superstar. Lee Mazzilli. Mazzilli. Why? Because he's from Brooklyn. Because he's yeah. from the good old days. He's supposed yeah. to remind you of what it was like when you, Mr. Season, potential yeah. season ticket holder, uh, fell in love with baseball. 
So that, that was a very powerful poll, even into the 80s, I think. Yeah. And until the Mets had something contemporary to sell, it, uh, it, it filled the gap. Thank you, Greg. Renee, you're up. Thanks, Gary. Uh, David, uh, great, uh, great. Thank you for being here. This is really cool. Um, I too remember that day. Um, I bought tickets. I told the story some time ago uh, for Mother's Day, weeks before the trade was ever done. Went to Manufacturers Hanover back then. That's where I went to to buy tickets. You know, go to a, a, a window for that while they were on the phone for that. Um, to, to find out in the papers, the trade, to yeah. go to the ball game, it was Mother's Day and they gave away bonnets to the, to the women there. My mom had a straw hat. I'll never forget it. It was overcast. Uh, as a kid, always looked at the scoreboard, the lineup, who was playing. You know, if the Mets are playing the Pirates, you know, it, it, uh, is Clemente in the game? You know, that kind of, to see 24 leading off, I lost it. My mom was jumping up. She was the one that told me the stories. She grew yeah. up, she was a giant fan. So. So we're sitting there and I wish I could remember how much the tickets were because we were sitting two sections away from third base to, and we're talking, you know, 72. So it probably cost like two cents. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So I'm buying three tickets and here he comes out from the center field gate in a San Francisco trolley car. I'm going to tell you, I remember jumping up and down as if it was uh, uh, New Year's Day because right. my mom was excited. She was crying. We're jumping up and down. Willie's coming out of the, 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 uh, uh, the you know, the, the vehicle and the place, standing ovation. I never forgot any of that stuff. Uh, 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 he meant more to me uh, through not only my mom's eyes, following him on the paper, you know, uh, game of the week, wherever I can get any news footage, news, anything uh, felt. So I was in love when he was here. Yeah. I, I mean, he was, I didn't, you know, yeah, he had bad games. Didn't care, didn't care. Cried like heck on Willie Mays night. Cried. I was like losing it. No, no. The World Series when you know, the incident happened it's, uh, uh, with the Cincinnati Reds and it's him, Yogi, uh, Rusty Staub, Cleon Jones tried to to, to the, the to, you know calm the crowd. I mean, he was everything to me, and I lost it again uh, uh, when uh, they're in Oakland. And they're announcing the lineups. And I'm, I'm going to exaggerate. It was a 20-minute standing ovation for, for, for Willie Mays. I remember my mom was in tears. I was happy as anything, the respect he's getting. You know what I'm saying? And, yeah, you know, I'm glad you guys brought it up. I've been wanting his number retired forever. And to find out that, God, if, if Joan Payson had lived longer, this would have happened really excites me and saddens me that the opportunity to never, and I'm still looking for that opportunity for that to happen because he is like a, 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 a close fr a school friend, a brother who's like, Hey, I'm leaving. I'm going to college. I'll see you. And then right. he comes back and you know, that, that, that was my thing. I, I loved it. I loved his years in New York and wanted that number retired uh, so much. So, and I still do. But thank you again. You know, you talk about him the same way Yankee fans talk about Mantle, and there are definite parallels. And the, the word that keeps coming back to me is they were both boyish. They were both polite. They were both deferential. Uh, they, but they were tough as nails ball players. I mean, they really were fierce competitors, and they loved to play. I think Tim McCarver, and I might have said this the last time I was here, I think Tim McCarver told a story about Maze like catchers try to get in the batter's heads and McCarver was trying to distract Willie and he was asking him a question. I think it was about a restaurant and in San Francisco and Willie answered the question as he hit the ball over the fence. <laughs> you know, and that that's so many great stories of Willie and to find out that much later on uh, 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 his baseball IQ was even I mean, you know, there's well, something to be yeah. said about athletes who are great athletes, and there's athletes who are not only great well, but have baseball and int sports intelligence. I, I, Their I know we have. I, I know we have. I know we have other hands. I just want to uh, very quickly address that, Renee. You know, he was interviewed maybe by Costas, and he said what he was the captain of the of the outfield, and he only had two, uh, or or he had three signals. 
left, my left, this way, or stay put. And if the outfielder didn't pay attention, that outfielder didn't play the next day. So, yes, his baseball IQ was severely underrated. I, and I think that, that made him a, a, that much of a greater player and that yeah. much of an exciting player. And even in the end, yeah. he didn't play very many games, but he played smart, very yeah. smart, very smart. Thank you again. Thank you, Renee. Uh, Coach, Coach Bob Mayer. Yeah, yeah just a moment. Uh, first, uh, I heard during an interview with Willie that he purposely swung and missed at certain pitches, knowing he would get that same curveball or slider the right. next time he was up if he had men on base. And it worked. Uh, talk about a guy knowing the game. Yep. But earlier, uh, somebody mentioned that Willie was not uh, taken in immediately. There was a little, uh, from what I heard from a couple of San Francisco writers, a little resentment that here are the Giants, yeah. and this is the guy you have to have as your hero. Right. They did love McCovey and Marichal, as somebody did say, but yeah. unquestionably, the number one hero was Cepeda. Yeah. Thank you, Gary. Thank and you, David, Bob. thank you. Richard Sternberg, you're up. Okay, guys, I haven't been on before. As way of background, I'm one of the trustees of the village of Cooperstown. So I posted in the chat room the name of the reference librarian of the Hall right. of Fame and her direct number, so you can get it from there. Two, Horace Stoneham story. A couple of years ago, uh, the former mayor of Cooperstown got me in touch, uh, got me in touch with I think the daughter or granddaughter, I think it was daughter, though. that granddaughter. doesn't quite sound right. Granddaughter. granddaughter. Oh, is that who I told you, Gary? Yeah, Jamie. Yeah. Stoneham. And she wanted to do something in his memory related to the Hall of Fame. And we negotiated back and forth for a while. And we were going to, we were considering how this, how shall I say, selling naming rights to the field house that we've reconstructed on Double Day Field. Uh, which has been like a five, six million dollar renovation of the field that we're just finishing up now. Yeah. That never went anywhere. There's another story, and we're not quite sure, but we think it's true. Some guy in the Hudson River Valley offered up the old flagpole from the polo grounds. And when we compared photos of it to the flagpole that it had been there, they were identical. That never came through. Right. But I thought you might find that, find those things interesting, guys, especially about Stoneham's granddaughter wanting to do something to honor him up here. Unfortunately, uh, the money never came up and uh, it's actually named after Bud Fowler who just got into the Hall of Fame. Right. Thank you, uh, thank you, Richard. Uh, Andy Q, you're up. Thank you, Gary. Uh, David, very nice presentation. I, I did want to discuss the, uh, what should I say, the, the price that, that uh, Mays commanded. I, I find it hard to believe, really, that anybody would have offered more money than Mrs. Payson did. Uh, you know, the price at the time, like Williams was a fairly decent prospect. You know, he'd stay seven years in the majors, I think, after, after the trade. Um, $100,000 was still pretty serious money in yeah. those days. And I just find it hard to be, if I look around the other teams, especially those in the National League East, um, and Willie at this point, to my mind anyway, is a left fielder. He, he can't play center anymore. He might be able to play right, but he, he can't really play anything but left. And, and when you look around the other teams that might have been interested, there just doesn't seem to be a match. Uh, so to me, this, this is clearly, to me, a sentimental move of which – Mrs. Payson would, would have obviously, I think, uh, gone for that. I mean, she had a very sentimental attachment to Mays. So it's, your, your it's thoughts on that? It's a sentimental move, and it was good to see you in Baltimore. It's a sentimental yes. move. Uh, but he, another team, especially a mediocre team, it would be a marquee move. And if you look at the AL, I, there's no question in, in my mind he could have contributed 
Um, if he had stayed on in 73, might have been a designated hitter in the AL. Uh, he stayed with the Mets. But had he gone to the Royals or the Tigers or some or you know so, something like that, uh, it would be a marquee play. It was Casey Stengel such a great manager in 1962, or was he a great manager because he had Mantle and Bauer and Barra and and all those guys? Uh, we we could debate that for an entire day. But uh, Casey was certainly his managerial instincts notwithstanding a a marquee value person in 1962 when the Mets first came on the scene. So I, I think there was a sentimental attachment. I don't think for a second, Mrs. Payson was thinking about Mays as a marquee draw. I think she just wanted him back. I think it, it was the right for her. It seemed like the right thing to do and to, you know, she, she was, she was a baseball person too. She saw that he couldn't run like he used to. She saw that he couldn't sprint to first base and, and leg out a grounder like he used to. So it was, it was a sentimental play to be sure. Yes. Thanks, thank you. Thank you, Andy. And, and David and Greg, you know, I've spoken to you both in the past. You really don't believe there's enough here for a book. Amazing the Mets. Amazing Mets. It's... I'd read it. <laughs> Amazing me. I'm talking you'd about read... you guys writing it. You'd read it, but would you write it? <laughs> well, <laughs> I, I, it, it, look, I, I, there, there have been books. I, there was a book about Bobby Thompson hitting the home run. Right. You know, Joshua Prager wrote an entire comprehensive epic masterpiece called The Echoing Green. Somebody wrote a book about the Pine Tar game with George Brett. So yeah, there there could be a book around it. There could even just be a book around the Mother's Day game. I think uh, it all depends on what on what avenue you're going to take. Got I think it. The, nope. book is the definitive book on Willie Mays because it points out the flaws as well as all the exploits. And to me, I've never read a book that pointed out his flaws and his also his early early life in Al in uh, in Alabama. Yeah. Thanks. Norm, you're up. Okay. Um, thank you, David, for the presentation and for a chance thank to you. talk about Willie Mays and to think about him. Um, I watched the um, Mays hit the home run um, before I came on to the um, Zoom today just to get myself all primed. Um, I just have a few comments. One is um, in terms of the SF not embracing Willie Mays and they embraced McCovey and Cepeda and Marichal. They were primed, many were primed not to embrace Willie Mays before Cepeda even walked onto the field because they felt they already had a center fielder here in San Francisco named DiMaggio. Yeah. And so there, that was a, there was that, that conflict there. Um, in terms of the home run, you know, in New York as a Met, when the Mets came to back to San Francisco for the first time with William Mays, I was at that game Friday night um, where Mays had a two-run homer, which provided the winning runs right. against the Giants off of Jim Barr. And the crowd in San Francisco went crazy yeah. that Mays hit that home run and no one cared that the Giants lost the game. Right. And I... Um, I have to agree with Bill Klink about not pensioning for Mays because I'm in San Francisco. I watched Willie Mays my entire lifetime. And the one thing I think about Willie Mays, well, many things, but the one thing I think about right now is Mays was one to rise to the occasion. Yeah. You know, there'll be some big moment and you want Willie Mays up. Just the day before in game six, Mays got a key hit in the 12th inning to lead the Mets to the victory. Yeah. But as old as he was, whatever it was, he still got that hit. He was Willie Mays. Yeah. And yeah, you can say it's sentimental and all that, but that's the guy I want up in that situation. Yeah. That's it. Thank, thank you, Norm. Jerry Austin from Ohio, you're up. Jerry, you got to unmute. Come on, Jerry. That it? That's it, good. That's okay, it. good, sorry. Um, I just wanted to mention, since I heard the name of, 
of Ed Cranepool. Mm -hmm. um, he and I were classmates at uh, James Monroe in the Bronx the same year and remind people that uh, he was, um, he broke every single record of Hank Greenberg, uh, who also went to James Monroe. And when he signed with the Mets in 62, after he graduated, he got $85,000 yeah. as a bonus when they had territorial rights at the time. And um, they shipped him uh, up to Buffalo. I think the first or second game there, he hit three home runs. Uh, but when Willie came to the Mets in 72, Crampo was already a 10 year veteran. And he held um, uh, the uh, Met record for most home runs by a lefty until Daryl Strawberry came along. Uh, he never he never became the great player that everybody thought he would would be. But right. one of the things that's not known about him, he was a great, I mean, great basketball player. And even though he was destined to to, to sign, you know, the, the baseball with the Mets, he was offered college scholarships by North Carolina and then that ilk. And, and he was a great and terrific athlete. So was Hank Greenberg was a really good basketball player. And my father played on the same team as him in the eighth grade, and they won the city championship. Does anybody else have a question who hasn't asked one or wants it? All right, we'll go to Renee, and then Mars, you have your hand up again? Yeah, I, I have some important points. Okay, Renee, uh, then Mars. Renee? Really, really it's, a, it's a question to Jerry. Jerry, you're a James Monroe, uh, Monroe graduate? Yes. So am I. What was your, what was your high school uh, graduation year? A little, a little before your time, 62. 77. A little before your time. So it's it's good to, for me personally to know that not, uh, uh, there was another that's a James Monroe graduate that's in this group, but not here tonight. But uh, good to hear about that. Um, um, uh, David, my, my other question to you is, um, with everything that's being said mm -hmm. about doing a book, mm -hmm. do you feel like you, you, you could put something together or, or you could find somebody to put something together? Because that would be great that, to see. To, to finally get a hold of, you know, not, not whether right it's now. that I'm, year or that month or his, his last uh, years in New York. Well, a couple of things. I'm working on a book for University of Nebraska Press about the cultural history of the Red Sox. And I'm working on a biography of Bo Bolinsky for McFarland. So okay. I can't take on another project right now. That's not to say that somebody else couldn't. Uh, maybe somebody in this room, maybe somebody is working on it now. McFarland has niches within niches, Nebraska, Roman, Sunbury. I mean, uh, you know, Andy will tell you, we were at the Sabre 50 convention in Baltimore. The vendors are look, always looking for authors. They're always looking for people to contribute. So maybe it'll be, be maybe it will be me down the road. Uh, but uh, Matt, didn't Matthew Silverman do a book about 73? I know someone did something called Swinging 73. Um, I, I don't know. know if it was Matthew, but it, but it was a, uh, it, it did cover the season. It was Matthew. Yeah. Greg, you got to be the man. All right. A Andy, Andy Baumgartner, go ahead. Okay. Un unmuted. You can hear me? Yes, Andy I can hear you. Every week. All right. Good to see David again. And of course, you've done a great job tying in the culture and the sports. Thank now, you. Gary, you got to go to the game and actually see the home run. What happened with me was I was 16 and had the Rangers won game six the previous Thursday, there would have been a seventh game Sunday afternoon in Boston. So I had negotiated with my parents, if there's a game seven, I'm staying home. And they said, OK, there wasn't a game seven. We went where we went and I missed the home run, but it was still a great moment it, it it happened it was it was a win right there that year by the way the knicks finished runner up to the lakers rangers runner up to the bruins nets runners up to the pacers and miss new york runner up for miss america and then two years later a girl from my high school won it tony godan anyway david thanks i look forward to your book on 66 oh, and i you. read your saber essay on west parker and oh thank great. you it yeah, he great. was great. Thank you. Wes Parker was even great in the uh, Brady Bucks. Mars, you're up. That's right. David, mentioned. there are two defini definitive books on New York City. One is Jane Jarvis' manifesto, Death of the American City. And the other one is The Power Broker, which yeah. is 1,300 pages uh, by Robert 
Caro. Right. And, uh, you know, when, when, when Stoneham was asking for the Hudson Docks and the Bronx side of the White Stone Bridge, it was turned down. O'Malley uh, was offered by Robert Moses the Flushing Meadow Swamp. Right. So who would want to come here? That's right. when Paul Stone should have stepped in and said, I'll take it and let uh, O'Malley go his way. The other points I wanted to mention was something Renee and I have a lot in common with, and that is there is no homage to Willie Mays in the Rotunda at the City Field. It's all for Jackie Robinson. And the last thing I wanted to mention was I've been on a campaign for the last several years to have not Oracle Park renamed, but to have just like Ricky Edison Field at uh, the Oakland Coliseum, Willie Mays Field with the 54 World Series catch with an image of that in right center field and have it Willie Mays Park at uh, Willie Mays Field at Oracle Park to finally give him the homage. Now, Larry Bear, who was on our Zoom uh, last year during spring training, said, there's enough we have on Willie Mays. And then I wrote to Mario Aliotto, one of the, you know, officers, and, and he, he repeated the same thing. So that's my, until my dying day, I'm going to campaign for that. Oh, last but not least, the 72 World Series, with the uh, Mets and the A's, uh, if they if great. that I'm game sure. wasn't in five o'clock and it was at a normal time, Willie Mays would have never lost the balls in the sun. Anybody else with a final comment or question who has not or wants to ask another one? Mars, it might take a change in Giants ownership for your dream to come true. Well, maybe that's what I need. That's what you need. Anyway, David, uh, we cannot thank you again for not oh, only thank a you. wonderful presentation, but I know we switched a couple of times, but uh, this worked out great. No problem. And, uh, you know, remember. please don't be a stranger when anything you knew you write out, I will send to all the members who might, who would be wise to purchase whatever you write. Guys, give Absolutely. it up for David thank Brown. You. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. I will.